interesting stewardship. Liturgically speaking, the offering has <coughs> nothing to do with money. In its purest form, the offering is understood as Christ. Christ on the cross offers a living sacrifice. Christ in the Lord's Supper offers a spiritual presence in this time and place. The true offering is Christ. The offering's original purpose in the service of worship was to allow a time for worshipers to focus on Christ. And this was done by having a reenactment, a symbolic reenactment of the Christ event. An offertory procession that involved bringing bread and wine to the temple reminded Christians of the body and blood of our risen Lord. In the second century, the offering was a religious offering, not a monetary one. The original offertory procession was a ritual of carrying bread and wine to the worship leader who stood at the table. And the offering procession visually demonstrated the Christian belief that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ shall come again. The elements of the bread and wine were offered by the people of God as gifts of God. Christ has been offered as a living sacrifice. Therefore, Christians in worship throughout Christianity have been encouraged to heed Paul's words to the Christians of Rome. It's in Romans 12 that Paul writes to Christians saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so the offering initially was the time in worship when the bread and wine was brought forward and placed on the table of Christ. And likewise, when receiving the Lord's Supper, the Christians were invited to make of their lives a living sacrifice, a spiritual worship, just as Christ, the true offering, was perceived to be spiritually present in the elements of bread and wine. Century upon century passed with the offering procession maintaining this Eucharistic shape and form. But by the time the Middle Ages arrived, it was clear that the offering had changed. Included in the worship ritual was a dramatic presentation of giving money that's how we have continued since the Middle Ages. We continue this offering procession to focus on gifts of money. And we've gone beyond the tradition of the churches in the Middle Ages. Not only have we added the process of bringing forward money, we have removed from worship the procession of bringing forward the elements of bread and wine. On those Sundays, when we have communion, the elements are placed on the table before worship commences. There's no procession that involves the presentation of the bread and the wine. And on those Sundays, when we do not have communion, the elements of the Lord's Supper are not present at all. Even though we have the baptismal font in each service, a reminder of baptism, the other sacrament of our church, we do not have the bread and wine. And many churches use the table for the table for the Lord's Supper as an altar for receiving the gifts of money. We, we don't do that here for Barbara. We have the, the stands on the side. The offering procession originally was intended to be a ritual 
to remind us of the presence of Christ, but instead it has become a procession to demonstrate our presence in relationship with God. Grant Copeland, the pastor who wants to get rid of the contemporary offering procession, concedes that it does accomplish four tasks. The contemporary offering symbolizes the offering of our lives to God. It dra dramatizes the congregation's financial stewardship. It reminds the members to support the church budget, and it gets the money to the front of the sanctuary. We make great fanfare of our offering, our offering. We have special music that dramatizes the moment. Even though we are instructed not to make a show of our gifts, we do. And, and we're a typical congregation. I'm not just picking on us here in Highland. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaches, whenever you give alms, do not sound the trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We are taught by Jesus not to be showy when we give alms, and yet, when there is no pandemic, uh, when we have the offering in our church, we make a grand display of our gift each Sunday. While the gifts are being received, we have a glorious offertory. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful music. And when the money is brought forward, we resoundingly sing the doxology. But realize when Jesus provides instruction on the appropriate way to give alms, he does not prohibit the gift. He's not speaking against giving money. Jesus simply encourages humility when making such a gift. And this teaching by Jesus about the giving of alms is informative, for it helps us to understand the evolution of offering practices. When we trace the roots of our Judeo-Christian tradition, we find three distinct forms of giving money. Alms, tithes, and the collection. There used to be three ways that people gave money. Alms were intended specifically for the poor. Are you familiar with the expression, alms for the poor? And alms in Greek form means mercy. Individuals address the needs of the poor by giving alms. I think most of our members here make contributions to individuals and organizations outside the church. And that would be the almsgiving of the individual members of our church. And historically, individual, uh, the money for almsgiving was given directly to the individual in need, or there was an alms box outside the temple so that people could contribute there. And the money was used to buy food, which we've heard today, and we're still doing, and other items for those in need. Typically, the widows, the orphans, the sick, and the poor. Persons who collected the alms and made purchases and distributed the goods were known as almoners. It's a word that has left our vocabulary, almoners. Today, the deacons in our churches are tasked with the function, the historic function, of the almoners. Alms were the funds given for the poor. Alms given was part of the religious code of Judaism that required good works. And alms were one of the three forms of money giving in the early church. Tithes were different from alms. And maybe you've noticed in the last decade when I call for the offering, I'll say, now may we present our tithes and our offerings. Tithes were given historically to support the temple. Tithes supported the religious institution itself. A modern application of tithes would be the portion, the proportion of our money, or the portion 
that keeps the church doors open, the physical plant, the utilities, the salaries, the new boiler, the sidewalks, the roof. While a tithe is commonly known as a 10% fraction, historically it would be considered to have been that portion of the funds that went to the maintenance of the institution. Alms and tithes were distinct, as was the collection. The collection was an opportunity for the religious community to make a corporate gesture of giving. Together, the money of believers was collected, probably at the end of the service, even after the worship ritual had been concluded. Justin Martyr in the second century writes about the collection. He said, those who prosper and who so wish contribute each as much as he chooses to. What is collected is deposited with the president, and he takes care of the orphans and widows and those who are in want on account of sickness or any other cause, and those who are in bonds and the strangers who are sojourners among us. And briefly, he is the protector of all those who are in need. The collection in the early church was not intended for the church itself. The collection was given to others in the name of the church on behalf of Christ. So these three forms of giving, of giving money in the ancient days, involved alms, tithes, and the collections. But none of these in the early church were considered to be the offering. The offering was the presentation of bread and wine. In our modern worship, when we call for the tithes and offerings, we blend into one moment 2,000 years of Christian practices. And while my colleague Grant Copeland is bold to suggest that we get rid of the offering in modern form, I am not so brave. Copeland wishes to see churches have a box outside the church itself, to be, uh, an alms box at the doors of the sanctuary. And he'd like for tithes to be designated for the church itself to be received in plates or baskets during worship and held by the ushers without bringing them forward during the service. And Copeland's exception to these suggestions is when the Lord's Supper is celebrated. On those occasions, he suggested that, suggests that in addition to bringing the elements of bread and wine, that on those days, the monetary offering, uh, the monetary gifts be brought forward. And then the elements would not be the elements would be placed on the table, but money would be placed um, on stands, not on the table itself, which is our practice here. When we think about it, we realize that our offering pales in comparison to the sacrifice of Christ. Nevertheless, we are called to make a sacrifice. A spiritual sacrifice of the financial gifts that God has given us. And that would be a symbolic sacrifice of the gifts that God has given us. And a spiritual sacrifice of our lives. And so may we faithfully respond to Paul's exhortation to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God as our spiritual